Hello, and welcome to the fourth annual Franklin Pond Chamber Music Competition. My name is Alpin Hong, and I'll be your host for this afternoon's celebrations. We have such an exciting lineup for you today. If you watch this afternoon's finalist showcase, you know that our young competitors have overcome enormous musical odds to achieve incredible results. Social distancing is no friend to chamber music, but where there's a will and a prize, there's a string quartet. Choosing a winner will certainly be a most difficult task for our judges, as all eight of our final ensembles are truly remarkable. Franklin Pond Chamber Music, soon to celebrate its 20th anniversary, was founded by Atlanta Symphony Orchestra violinist and longtime educator Rhonda Respis. What began as a small summer program with only 16 students has now blossomed into a year-round institution offering students intensive chamber music study with some of the nation's most distinguished artists. Franklin Pond's faculty draws from the rosters of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra and the Atlanta Opera, and its guest artists come from all over the country and the world to work with these talented and determined young people. My first introduction to Franklin Pond's chamber music was through its exceptional faculty. Many years ago, I had the pleasure of playing alongside Franklin Pond faculty with some gifted elementary school musicians who, unknown at the time, would one day become Franklin Pond students. I've been back to Atlanta many times since then, including for Kennesaw State University's celebration marking its opening as an all Steinway school, Trinity School's gala at Symphony Hall, and the debut of my theatrical show Chasing Chopin. As a touring concert pianist for the last 19 years, I've experienced firsthand how institutions like Franklin Pond elevate their communities by providing the next generation of leaders an outlet for their passion and determination. Though I can't be in Atlanta to enjoy the previously planned live awards concert, I am thrilled to be here today with all of you on screen hosting this very special event. The Franklin Pond Chamber Music Competition began four years ago and has until this year been held at Spivey Hall at Clayton State University. Competition finalists performed on this acoustically stunning stage for a live audience and panel of internationally acclaimed judges. Winners were announced at the Afternoon Awards concert, where faculty, judges, and the grand prize winners in each division performed live. This year, of course, was a game changer. Ensembles who had been rehearsing diligently the entire school year now faced the prospect of a canceled event and no outlet for their hard work. Let's let founder and artistic director Rhonda Respis and her daughter, competition manager Ginny Fairchild, tell us what happened next. Thank you, Alpin. Thanks, Alpin. On the pre-COVID competition timeline, preliminary videos were due April 15th. It was almost a month before that when quarantine began, so we were pretty sure most of the ensembles had not yet made their entry videos. Mm -hmm. Knowing this, our next thought is that we'd have to cancel altogether because the groups wouldn't be able to get together and re rehearse and record. Well, this didn't set well with us at all mm -hmm. because we know how much work the students had already put in and looking forward to the competition and how many other events in their lives have been canceled. The performances, graduation, school trips, summer festivals. Yeah, absolutely. So we wanted to offer something for the students to do, something to look forward to, something to keep their musical juices flowing, and then hopefully a learning experience that they could take with them into their future endeavors. Yes, and then we thought about our college alums who came back home suddenly in the middle of March. So we decided to add a category for them this year, realizing that they had to form a group choose a repertoire, practice separately, rehearse somehow virtually, and perform, all without ever seeing each other in person. <laughs> it's an amazing process. So there, there are other competitions around the country that have gone virtual, of course. So many events have had to take that route. Mm -hmm. But what makes this competition such a unique experience for everyone is that very thing, that the competitors had to record everything while in quarantine. 
Yes, well, you know, Jenny and I have tried that, right, Jenny? Yep. And, and, and I know that every professional who's tried and made, attempted to make chamber music video in this fashion will attest to the fact that it's a mammoth task and it tests the abilities and the patience of even the most seasoned musicians. <laughs> it, it really does. To recreate that seamless flow of uh, the conversation that occurs between members of a chamber ensemble, uh, to do that while you're miles apart, sometimes even continents apart. One of our groups uh, this afternoon, um, a violinist uh, was in Korea when he made his recording. It's really fascinating. Um, so to recreate this is at the very least uninspiring. You have to play like you're comfortably surrounded by the sounds and energy of your group, <laughs> when in fact you are alone in a quiet room with one earbud and a small video screen to keep you company. There are no click tracks. But these students rose to the occasion. They spent hours and hours, not only trying to record and sync with each other and learn how to produce and edit high quality videos, but playing, performing music, playing musically. That's so difficult. If you haven't watched the final showcase though, which aired earlier today at two o'clock on YouTube, you should check out that link. The interviews were fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited to hear about the kids' experiences bringing the, this project to life. We wanted them to learn something, and I think we've achieved it. I certainly hope so, and I, I think so too, uh, which leads me to the last little thing that I'd like to, to say, and this goes directly to you guys, students. You should be so proud of yourselves. This is a huge project, a huge task. Yes. You have risen to the occasion, and, and you are all superstars. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thanks, guys. So good to see you. What interesting times we live in right now. Next up, let's hear a little about this year's distinguished panel of judges. Maestro Carlos Iscarai is the music director of the Alabama Symphony Orchestra and the American Youth Symphony in Los Angeles, California. A native of Venezuela, Iscarai came to the U.S. as an accomplished young cellist, graduating from Interlochen Arts Academy, New World School of the Arts, and Jacobs School of Music at Indiana University. After learning conducting from his father, he honed his skills at the Aspen Conducting Academy and now leads world-class ensembles across five continents. A strong believer of supporting the younger generations, Iskarai has worked extensively with the world's top talents and leading music institutions, including his home country's El Sistema. Building on his passion for music education, he became the music director of the American Youth Symphony in autumn of 2016. Before stepping up to the podium, Carlos was an active cellist and chamber musician, serving as principal cello of the Venezuelan Symphony Orchestra. He is also a composer, writing a variety of works, including his most recent work, Geometric Unity, which was composed, recorded, and produced during the COVID-19 quarantine. A dual citizen of Spain and Venezuela, Carlos lives in Birmingham, Alabama with his wife and three children. Pianist Elizabeth Pridgen enjoys a busy and distinguished career as a piano soloist, chamber musician, and professor. She is artistic director of the Atlanta Chamber Players, one of the leading chamber ensembles in the United States. She is also piano chair at both the McDuffie Center for Strings and the Townsend School of Music at Mercer University. An alumna of Juilliard and Peabody, Ms. Pridgen began her studies at the age of five. Her first concert appearances were with her grandfather, violinist Martin Salzer, former concertmaster of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. Today, she performs throughout the U.S. and Europe and is a recurring guest at the Rome, Italy Chamber Music Festival, the Kontiki Chamber Music Festival in Oslo, Norway, the Aspen Music Festival, the Amelia Island Chamber Music Festival, Madison Chamber Music Festival, and the Highlands Cashiers Chamber Music Festival. Ms. Pridgen is a member of the Cortona Trio with violinist Amy Schwartz Moretti and cellist Julia Albers. Ms. Pridgen lives in Atlanta with her husband. They are thrilled to be expecting their first child, a girl, this September. Richard Roberts is the longtime concertmaster of the Montreal Symphony Orchestra. He was also assistant concertmaster of the Cleveland Orchestra under conductor Lauren Mazel. 
As a young student at Indiana University, he studied violin with Joseph Gingold and chamber music with Janusz Starker and William Primrose. Later, in Geneva, Switzerland, he worked with the legendary soloist Henrik Schering. Mr. Robert's solo and chamber career has taken him throughout South America, Australia, Mexico, the United States, and Europe. Orchestrally, he has also played around the globe, working with the orchestras of Edmonton, Melbourne, Bergen, Sao Paulo, Detroit, and Cleveland, to name a few. He has worked closely with the eminent composers Aaron Copland, Darius Millot, and Olivier Messiaen. Since 2004, Mr. Roberts has also served as concertmaster of the Bellingham Music Festival. He has served on the faculties of many distinguished universities, given master classes throughout the world, and serves as an editor for Ovation Press Music Publishing Company. Hello, judges. Thank you for being available to speak to me today. What a glorious whirlwind it's been. You've had the unenviable task of judging eight tremendously talented ensembles in a format never attempted before. Can you describe what the process has been? How did you need to adjust how you approach adjudicating a classical music competition that can't be live? I know it's difficult for the, for the candidates and the groups because you're not together. You're in different rooms and uh, different acoustic environments too. So even if you, uh, under the best of circumstances, uh, if you have a click track, then it's very difficult to play together, uh, you know, when you're recording separately. But it's also uh, concomitantly um, difficult for us too, because we don't get the range of dynamics that you might have with a live performance. You don't get the same sense of ensemble you don't get the same sense of complicity between the players uh, that you might in a live concert. So it's really very, very difficult for us. Well, I approach this from a, from a couple of angles. Uh, actually, I, I would add the third, which is so from, from one end, I'm, as a former chamber musician, uh, you know, a cellist, I was looking at, at just those, those sort of parameters, things that one normally looks at. I was seeing it from one end, just as a regular uh, performer, just trying to see if they're rushing, if they're not rushing. Like Richard said, what are their phrases, the, 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 the cultural knowledge, how much they were able to put together something. We had to get creative too in, in how to look at them and, and, and try to make it the most balanced. I think a lot of people, a lot of, there have been a lot of discussions in the age of COVID about what is essential to human beings. And obviously the first thing, obviously was toilet paper that came to people's minds. Uh, and then perhaps right after that was food. Um, but again, as they say that music is the food of the soul, that we have been starving. And I think that a lot of people have felt this way, that there's something empty that they can't fulfill, even though we have, you know, all of these streaming services, we have all these virtual performances online to experience that still that there is something missing. And uh, Carlos, you did a really great uh, description about how the American Youth Symphony is responding to this and how your organization is adapting to the socially distanced world. Uh, could I ask actually Elizabeth and Richard, perhaps how the organizations that you are part of, that you lead are adapting to this um, and perhaps what you see going forward for the next few months? Uh, well, uh, right now there's nothing happening here um, in Montreal, where I am. Uh, but we're in the planning stage for empty hall concerts or, or uh, adjusted audience configurations. Uh, we'll have to see. Uh, we've got several months where everything has been canceled for the summer. There were two, two festivals I was involved in. They're canceled, so I'm not doing any playing at all, uh, except for I start every day at 9.30, I start to practice. And uh, I mean, it's for, I'm reviewing old repertoire. I'm trying to learn new things and uh, do my scales and my etudes and uh, things like this uh, and until lunchtime. So, um, uh, you know, I, I keep myself alive this way, but it's with the hope, you know, that we'll come back to it sometime. Uh, it's gotta be for something, this practicing. It's, of course, there's an element of personal pleasure. I love to do it. I love to practice. This is my time of discovery, and I'm still learning uh, how to use my instrument and make the music come out of it and produce a nice sound. Um, but uh, we're still in the planning stages of our orchestra and our chamber music um, uh, series 
concerts, uh, but they might be for just empty hall. Well, I'm very excited. We um, are going to have our first attempt at a live stream performance next week, actually. Um, we've got a couple Whoa. of players who have been quarantining together, which is very convenient so that they can actually, they don't have to record remotely, they can perform in the same space. <laughs> and um, that will be streamed for a small group of our patrons next week and then we're looking at doing another performance later in the summer at a church here in Atlanta um, now that we're kind of slowly opening back up a little bit you know people in very small groups can get together and um, we're looking to give a concert where um, at a church where they have been live streaming so they've got all the equipments there and the people who know how to work the equipment who can help us and so we're hoping to do that over the summer but looking to the fall when our next season will start you know of course we want to have the capability of live streaming because we don't know yet what the situation is going to be but i'm also hopeful that we will be able to meet again in person and i think chamber music we're lucky we are it's a smaller group of musicians we're playing in smaller spaces for smaller audiences and it's not as expensive to put on a chamber music concert and so my hope is that we'll have the flexibility to you know choose the right kind of space to um, have people sit further apart. You know, I don't know if there will be face masks involved and keeping the spaces clean, but, but my hope is that we will actually be playing live concerts again next season. As music director of a, of a full-time professional orchestra in, in Birmingham at the Alabama Symphony, that's, uh, that's one of the challenges that we're looking to face, to how to connect with our audience. And uh, the, obviously the remote, uh, this sort of vignette type of projects, that's one thing, and there, there's there's the, the range of going from full orchestra to something uh, some, somewhere in between. But this uh, controlled spaces is something that is uh, already being looked at. I know that we have an upcoming uh, performance at an empty hall where we're going to have just a very limited number of players spread out, uh, that kind of thing. Being imaginative, also connecting with the community. For example, let's just give you a good, good, good example here, the churches. The churches, uh, many of them are also closed and uh, people are not, e going, not able to congregate and go to the places where they would normally connect with their, with their, with their community, you know, the faith community and other kinds of congregations. So um, connecting with these, with these places so that maybe small groups, you know, or, and, and can also taking all the necessary precautions and working with authorities, etc. Um, as we gradually go back to the, to, to the at least playing together in a live performance, whether there's an audience or not, these are all things that are having to be considered. All the in-between, between our rooms and the full concert hall, all that in-between range is something that is being, that is being explored so, so that we can uh, eventually connect with each other as musicians and with our audience in a real live performances. Absolutely. I wanted to uh, actually go back to a little detail that jumped out at me when Elizabeth was talking about the idea of those of musicians who have chosen to quarantine together, which I it, it put to there kind of a fun, oh my goodness, ladies and gentlemen, Grammy Award winning, globally renowned violinist and activist, Midori has just Zoom bombed our conversation. Wow, we're so honored to have you here, Midori. How are you doing today? Fine, thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you, even though it's all online, and I'm sorry I can't be there physically with any of you. Well, we, we were just discussing on how we were keeping our musical flames alive uh, during this time of quarantine. Uh, what have you been up to over the past couple of months? Well, um, I'm right now in New York in my mother's kitchen. Um, this is where life happens for me at the moment. It's always in my mother's kitchen. This is where the best internet is, and this is where the, the table is, and this is where the laptop is. And since the middle of March, when the travel restrictions came in order, um, I have been in New York. It, was, it happened right at the time of uh, spring break. Yeah, we were just discussing um, that uh, a little bit. Uh, she was talking about musicians that have chosen to quarantine together so they can actually continue to play together. And 
you've honestly chosen to quarantine with your mom. Uh, this, uh, I'm sure your mother is probably feeling what a lot of uh, parents of uh, musicians uh, that are college musicians who have come home are experiencing right now, but obviously you have a wonderful relationship with her. You're not only a famous violinist, but you are also a dedicated activist for music and musicians around the world. Can you tell us a little bit of the work that you do off the stage and what you are able to continue to do here in the age of Corona? I myself am not separating the work I do as a violinist in any particular um, compartment, so to say, any portions. I practice, I perform, I teach, um, I advocate for music, I work with young people, um, I work with the elderly population, I work with people who are um, in hospitals or in special institutions or otherwise restricted for various reasons. Um, and we are actually always enjoying music together so that's why i don't actually um i don't separate into different compartments you know whether i'm the one playing or i'm the one listening or somebody else is listening while i'm playing we're all being brought together by music now um obviously i'm surrounded by these esteemed musicians who have just judged uh, a bunch of young people entering a chamber music com uh, competition virtually having created these video submissions online uh, have you done any uh, Zoom performances or had to record any socially distanced recordings during this time of the last couple of months? There have been some. Um, so recording and then submitting it to be aired online, for example. It's not different from YouTube so much, but it's recorded in a rather um, sort of unprofessional setting. Um, and, and then obviously I haven't been able to leave my mother's apartment or I'm from New York City in the time being. So everything happens either in the kitchen or um, when there is no online um, necessity, then I do it in the room where there is actually a little bit more room, uh, where I record myself and then send it um there has been um and there have been many many lessons actually we're all teaching online um and i'm grateful to have that capacity um for me to imagine um you know not having lessons with my students and not having access to my students for such a long time already uh, it would be unthinkable and so i'm grateful to have that capacity of course it doesn't replace the in-person um i miss making music with others uh, i enjoy listening to others but i miss making music together and so, you know, there's an extra effort that must have gone in. I actually happen to have listened to um, most of um, the submissions that were given for this competition, and I plan to actually listen to all of it. And if the judges wouldn't act, and I would like to actually send along my comments to be passed on to each of the groups afterwards. Um, I'm not judging, but just I have comments, and I'd love to share them. Well, the one thing that seems to unite all of our experiences is I think the, the central aspect of what making music is, it is about love, right? It is about love for this tradition, love for the gift that we have to have had parents and, and teachers support us and help craft our talents so that we can make this incredible art form together. And the fact that, you know, as they all, it's the saying is that, uh, you know, love conquers, conquers all things even death. And in this time, of course, of such struggle and such uncertainty for everyone, uh, thank you all so much for contributing everything that you do uh, for, to this art form that we all love, and in the hopes, of course, that we'll be all able to gather together in person to celebrate it. Thank you so much, Midori, Maestro Carlos Iskarai, uh, El uh, pianist Elizabeth Pridgen, and violinist Richard Roberts. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, and stay safe and healthy to all of you and all of you watching out there. Thank you. you all too. Hi, I'm Ginny Fairchild, competition manager for Franklin Pond Chamber Music. I'm very proud to be presenting this afternoon's award for the College Alumni Division. This category of competitors is new to the competition this year. It was only in April that the division was announced, which means that our finalists had to form a group, pick repertoire, rehearse, record, and edit in the space of a few short weeks, all while staying completely socially distanced. They never once saw each other face to face during this whole process. I'm bowled over by what they accomplished in such a short amount of time. So let's take a closer look at each of our group groups.
I wanted to ask each of the ensembles some questions, and I thought you might answer them for me. First of all, uh, you guys have one of the coolest, if not the coolest, chamber music ensemble name ever. It's Sportsando, spelled with an S. Four Z A N D O. I have to ask you, how did you guys come up with this name? So when we started, when we became a group, we were, I was a sophomore in high school, I'm now a sophomore in college, so it was four years ago, and we were very focused on playing great music, but we were very focused on being the coolest group ever, and so we had to come up with the best name ever, and so I don't remember who came up with it but we were like thinking about cool names and it had to be a pun and it had to be like, obviously it was a quartet and Sforzando was like the perfect marriage of all of those things. Um, so since we've all been really close friends for a really long time, we started playing together in like 2015. So I wouldn't say that like one specific person led the whole rehearsal, it was like all four of us contributed equally and we all were like really good with communicating with each other. Um, we got like off topic a lot, but I would say because we are so close, we were like, okay, we have to rehearse like 30 minutes and then we'll chat for 10 minutes and then repeat that until we accomplished what we wanted to accomplish. But yeah, that was pretty much a rehearsal process. Arya, you were you had your hand raised for a second. Um, you were saying that like, you know, what, what are some of the challenges, like I said, of putting it together in this way? Like, what have you found that was just most difficult about this? Maybe? Um, well, we've begun the recording process. So I went first, and then after that, um, we decided that Annabelle should go next, because we were going to start with a bass and then it and go up. Okay. Um, and there was, like, a lot of issues that come with trying to play with of recording and lining things up and making sure, especially since our piece, like how tempo changes and a lot of passing off of rhythms and um, being together at different points and like maybe being off by one beat. So like there's been a lot of challenges with that. Well, I've been trying to record for the last two days and I've had to oh. stop myself each time because it just starts to get physically taxing. But I finally got a take, a decent, a decent take today um, and I tried to put them together and the beginning was together and sounded fine but then as the recording went on my part started to get more and more and more behind so then by the end of the piece I was like two beats behind and so I panicked and I texted my uncle who's amazing with like technology and like video editing and everything um, and he said the frame rate was probably different because when I played the two recordings on separate devices, they lined up, but I almost lost it. May I ask, like I said, some of the, th could you describe what people like yourselves that are in groups that play together uh, are missing from not being able to do this together? If you can speak to what you feel is lost when people are not able to do this. Well, I feel like a lot of music is like being social with each other and with the audience but like in terms of with each other like in rehearsal you'll like rehearse like a spot with like maybe two people and then like if something happens there might be like an inside joke or something and you'll look at each other and smile and like just like cueing people in just having eye contact and feeling the energy around you I feel like that's a lot of what's missing in like, the recording and just trying to like copy that type of energy when you're alone is difficult and it's kind of like one of those things that you take for granted and then when it's gone you're like whoa <laughs> well ladies first of all um you guys have done a spectacular job today i thought your answers were really wonderful thank you for being such wonderful uh guests for this interview uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing your performance. Best of luck in the competition, and I can't wait to see you in the finals.
I just wanted to get to talk to you a little bit so that our audience can get to know you a little bit better and, and know a little bit about your process because I feel like chamber music, uh, it's definitely more interesting when you know about the musicians and the relation to each other outside of just the pieces that might be a couple hundred years old uh, that we play with each other. And so I wanted to start by saying that obviously because of the coronavirus, all of us had to make a lot of adjustments to how we even meet together, the fact that we can't actually. Why have you decided to come back together to have this grand reunion to enter the competition again this year? We've never actually played together, but um, Phoebe sent us a piece in our group chat and we were like, okay, let's do this. But um, we all met at Bowdoin um, Festival two years ago and we've all been friends, but we've never been in an official chamber group before. So this is kind of like our first time playing together. We've sight read some things, but we haven't actually rehearsed together before. <laughs> uh, what are some of the challenges you guys ran into into trying to rehearse, rehearse, uh, match up with Helen's recording? Yeah, I think I've been doing a similar thing, just like playing it along to Helen's recording. And I think there's actually one advantage in doing this virtually is like you know exactly how she's going to do it like way before the moment because you can practice it with the exact timing like 20 times and then when the actual thing comes like you know when to anticipate for like her cue like the very last like two measures it's like something slow it pauses for a second and then it just like charges to the end and like I know exactly how much time she's gonna take because I've already listened to it 20 times and that's been kind of fun it's like a little game amazing amazing uh, can you guys maybe talk about maybe how this has actually improved your musicianship in a way that just another chamber music competition might not? Um, well, just this whole um, COVID crisis in general, which has been so uh, such a difficult time for everybody. Um, if there is one thing that musically I could have gained from this and this competition in included is, um, you know, I have to record every week for my teacher because that's how I have my lessons now. Um, I record for my own students and now I am doing some virtual chamber music with people um, that I don't usually get to play with, which is um, really great. And also it's made the process of recording a lot more natural, I think, because it's such an uncomfortable and unnatural environment for a musician to be in. Um, but since I'm doing that so much now, um, as painful as it is, it's actually making recording a lot easier, which is always a great skill to have because even after all of this is over, I'm still gonna have to record things a lot of the times. So if I'm performing, if I'm in a live performance on stage, let's say I'm performing with my string quartet, I'm not really worried about like missing notes at all, especially as a violist. Like no one really notices if I miss a note or if I like play like the, the wrong chord or something. But when you're recording, your own part individually, like you just, you can't afford to make those kinds of mistakes because there's like this pressure on you, not only from yourself, but also from like, just like everyone, because you you have so many takes to record this perfectly. So right. there's kind of an expectation to have everything like, like. Exactly like, the way it's supposed to be, yeah. When you're playing a live performance, it's kind of ephemeral, like it's in the moment, whatever. But if you're making a recording like this, like recordings are forever, which is great because like it's not gone after you perform. But on the other hand, like whatever mistakes you make, like one, a recording will amplify the mistakes themselves and then make them permanent, which obviously when we play music, we shouldn't be just thinking about not making mistakes, but it is definitely something that is like we have to pay a lot more attention to when we are making recordings. Another thing is like with the whole coronavirus thing, we can't really have in-person lessons. And it's been interesting because when you record and you listen to your own recordings, you're like forced to be really critical of your own playing. And in that way, you're kind of learning how to be your own teacher kind of in the way that yeah. you need to like actively like think about oh like what if I took more time here like this note like sticks out like what's going on and be able to like critically examine your playing in like a more detailed way. Part of the reason like people like classical music is a little bit like scary to people is because the pieces are just so long and it's 
there's like an air of pretension about it. I don't know. I, I would start by like putting on pieces that tell like really interesting stories or that people are really going to enjoy. Like, like, I don't know, like Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet suite, like that. Well, at the same time, it combines like this story that everyone knows with a composer that they maybe haven't heard before, and it opens up this door into like the world of modernism and Prokofiev, while you're like bridging it with like this accessible story. I love that the idea that in order to, that there's a story behind all of these things. Um, I hope you guys are as excited about your participation in this one. It is one of the first times, obviously, for Franklin Pond doing this. I've had so much fun talking to you today, guys. I feel like we could hang out like for the rest of the day and just get even nerdier as the day went on. But I just wanted to I said I send thank you for being such wonderful interview guests today. Um, I want to wish you the best of luck in constructing your recording and in the competition. And I can't wait to meet you all in person when it's possible. Thanks again, and uh, we'll see you soon, okay? And now to announce the winners for this year's 2020 College Alumni Division. In second place, our runners up, Trio Arabiata. And in first place, our grand prize winners, Sports Sando. Congratulations to all of you. You should be very, very proud of your accomplishments. So now let's turn to the performance by our grand prize winners at Sportsando. A quartet made up of Pasacalia Mason and Emma Lynn on violin, Annabelle Spato and Aria Posner on viola and cello.
So uh, when we left off, uh, Danny had just brought up this, uh, this very you know, important point about the difference about making music together live as opposed to creating this video, that there's a certain amount of creativity or at least musicality that is impossible to do on video. Uh, for those of you that are watching at home, uh, what, what they've been doing essentially is layering audio tracks on top of each other. So one person in the, in the ensemble is designated as the primary. Sometimes it's the pianist, sometimes the cellist. And I'd like to ask the four of you, who did you designate as the primary and how did you come to that decision? Jen Ching starts the piece by himself. And so mm -hmm. it was a logical choice for him to, to begin. And he has the most notes, like Carolyn said. And we tried it a different way. We tried it with me going second in the mix. 
and uh, can you identify for the viewing audience uh, uh, what instruments you guys are in the quartet? They may not and know. I play viola. Carolyn is second violin, and uh, that just didn't work very well. And so um, then Danny, we took uh, me out, and Danny went and recorded on top of Jun Ching, and then it was much easier for Carolyn and I to fit within that framework, having the 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 columns of the bass line down and all the filigree of the first violin. I actually, I, I do agree. And um, I think the instrument has the most melodic, um, you know, themes. To have the most ability to express yourself without a straitjacket and for John Ching to go first makes the most sense. Um, what I had to do um, once John had put it down is um, listen, I, I fr frankly, first listen with the music a number of times to see where he takes musical freedoms. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when he also has some rest to kind of calculate if I'm playing, um, if he's moving a little bit ahead during that time to make sure that it tries to line up as close as possible to that so that, so it makes sense. Um, but I had to do it a few times without my instruments and then a number of times um, with the instrument as well, just to kind of um, literally write certain notes down in my music. Okay, move a little bit more here than you net maybe would naturally. Wait a little bit more here, um, just to have it line up, which is not something that we would naturally have to do if we're playing with each other, because we can totally play off of each other and be synchronized because we're communicating in real time with each other. Yeah. Well, I'd like to maybe turn the conversation, you know, from the recording process and the actually building the video itself um, to uh, what you what your experience is during quarantine. Like, how have you kept your musical juices flowing? You know, I know that uh, many of you performed in the orchestra together and as a chamber ensemble um, and not being able to do that, not being able to be in contact and breathe together, as Paul so eloquently said before, the, the, the kind of thing that that connects you to one another. How do you manage to do that? And some, and it's okay to say that you haven't been able to do that. Yeah, the first the first few weeks, uh, and I think the last Atlanta Symphony service was on March 11th, and uh, then we pretty much shut down after that. Um, and those first two or three weeks, I, fe I felt it was quite, of course I was concerned about um, the virus and, and transmission of the virus and was reading up about, about that. But as far as my musical juices and, and what was getting me going was, um, it, it was kind of a luxury to not having to cram for next week's orchestra program. Cause we do, we do a different subscription every week of, uh, you know, big classical works, but we often do two or three programs of uh, different types in a week. Now I, I just so miss my colleagues and and the orchestra sound and that 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 88 piece living organism that we you know inhabit on stage. I, I think I I feel a lot of what Paul has already shared. Um, there is a there is a certain sense of loss I think in being able to express yourself with your colleagues and make, um, for me, music making has always been, uh, it's not music making, but it's a, it's a very spiritual experience, especially depending on the program. Um, I'm very hopeful that we'll be, we'll, we'll be able to do this again sooner than later. Um, and I think all of us on both sides of the stage, quite frankly, I think we'll appreciate only more really what music making, you know, means to us individuals, how we express ourselves with our audiences, our patrons. Um, I think people, just even watching a movie, um, you know, you hear the music and you go, yeah, you know, that's music. And, and I miss being able to be part of that. Um, so it, it's an adjustment, certainly, but I think for the first time, I think we're all trying to navigate and sort of being reactive trying to plan for the future again, which I think is the first step in recovering out of all of this. It's odd um, right now. And it's kind of funny because my TDP students, I've continued to teach. 
and some of them um one of them i know is is in one of the groups that's competing um but they got to keep like working on their pieces and actually record them for their little jury stuff and and I, I kind of I, I was kind of jealous that they had a goal <laughs> to work toward you Absolutely. know and yes. they were getting better each week and getting to perform and I took kind of and I'm I'm trying to to keep it up now it's now I got to keep it up I didn't know we were going to go for so long but it's looking you know this is taking longer to get us back and everything um, I just took kind of a clinical approach and went what are my weaknesses in my playing and this is a rare opportunity for me to really go back and address some things that I've wanted to address forever. I mean, one one thing um, that we should stress is that um, we've been lucky enough to play, you know, through Franklin Pond for, for close to 20 years and through the ASO, the Atlanta Symphony for close to 30 years. Uh, I mean, I think Danny is the, the, the youngest tenured among us and, it, you know what you're you're almost to your 30th season right so yep. um so that that which we you know i've taken for granted for so long like hey you know one of the best things about playing in a really great symphony orchestra and with a really good string quartet is that i know that if somebody has to play a certain passage that they're going to play it really really well and that I can rely on, you know, a, a, a flute solo in a Mahler symphony or, you know, or a cello part in a string quartet or viola, you know, second violin. That that when one of my colleagues that I've been on stage with for so long play something, I know it's going to sound great. And you don't you don't realize how quickly that goes, <laughs> how, how, how ephemeral that actually is. And so that's been the thing that I've really appreciated, um, appreciated and also miss a great deal. As performers, you know, we are, we, are, we are performers at heart. That's why we do what we do. That's why we chose the life path that we do. This, you know, this is why, you know, we're not librarians. And, you know, the idea that we, we have performed our whole lives for a goal, right? It's always the next performance, the next performance, and not to have, like I said, something to work towards. This idea that yeah. all of this, Franklin Pond, chamber music, the ASO, uh, even the competition, what it all comes back to is love, right? It's an expression of love for our common humanity. It is a love for tradition. It is a love for our teachers that able to give us the gift of musicianship our parents or anyone who supported us to allow us to have a life in music and for those people behind the scenes the camera people the recording people the administrators of Franklin Pond you know the founders that that had a vision that there should be a place for kids to come together and share this common love of this great art form this is why we need to preserve it to do everything we can and I just like to thank the four of you for all of your dedicated years of service to the city of Atlanta to the students of Franklin Pond and to all of your own students um, and for coming together, I guess, again, in this extraordinary time to share that with all of us. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Good afternoon. I'm Rhonda Respis, Franklin Pond's founder and artistic director. The ensembles in our high school division are the reason this event is happening today. As Ginny and I mentioned earlier, we were aware that so many of the groups have been working all school year in anticipation of performing their chamber works and entering this competition. When all of their performance opportunities were suddenly canceled, we knew we had to make the competition happen. Here's a look at each of our six finalists. As you realize, of course, this competition is like no other. It's happening at a time unlike any in history where all of us are being forced to socially distance because of the virus. And let me ask the first question. Uh, were you a quartet before the virus happened? Uh, we were. Um, we were practicing like for the whole year. Um, like, like during the school year, kind of during the SYO season. Uh -huh. So yeah, we've been doing that before the, this whole thing happened. <laughs> How did you guys come up with the name, the Oriole Quartet, and, and what does it mean? 
so we were like really confused it was like i think it was like the day before like the day we had to like submit our information for the quartet okay. and like we had no idea what to call ourselves but um in the woodruff arts center like we would always be assigned to play in the circle room okay and richard like actually came up with the idea and he thought uh like oreo means circle in greek i think all right like ancient greek so we, we just went with that since it was a circle room but like oreo sounds cooler than circle can you describe to me what the process of making the video uh a video recording at a distance of death in the maiden movement one by schubert has been like recording is a kind of a long and tedious process especially when you're by yourself but um first we had danielle play the first violin part okay and then all of us uh listen to her part and then record and okay. then we put that together and then see how it goes and then re-record parts if we need um at first it was very stressful because i could not get a good recording you know there's always like someone walking in or you know the doorbell rings or yeah. someone calls you in the middle of your recording so i was starting to get really stressed because like like everyone else was counting on me to get this recording done and i wanted to finish it so right. that i could get it to them quicker so that was definitely very stressful, but one thing that definitely helped was we had a set tempo. Like we had a goal tempo before we went into quarantine. We knew way before what we wanted to do. And also we had talked a lot about how stylistically we wanted to play it. There were definitely some sections that were a little bit tricky to lead in because like I either have a rest, so I have to count that rest very cleanly instead of just listening to someone else's part. That's right, yeah. And I mean, there are, like, Death and the Maiden is one of those pieces where, like, everyone's contributing and right. not just me leading. Yeah. Uh, Richard leads in, you know, everyone's playing together at some part. So it was a little bit stressful to not have everyone else there to, like, um, contribute to that, but I, it worked. Could I have some uh, some of you comment on how would, how are ways that you would get other students your age who are, who have no familiarity with classical music to come experience it and maybe even to hear you play personally? Uh, we can just make like the performance itself more entertaining by accompanying like musicals, um, or we can like like make people get used to the classical music by like using social media since it's like such a big part of like people's lives. I think I would just tell my friends because a lot of my friends, they would just watch it because like I'm there or like I'm sure uh, for like for um, the other people in the quartet, like their friends would probably just watch it because they're there. Mm -hmm. And I do have a lot of friends that are involved in classical music, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure uh, having friends like that who aren't involved like that would kind of get them more like aware about classical music like this. Uh, connections that don't necessarily involve classical music, I'm sure like that would help a lot like to bring more awareness about it. You bring up a very interesting point because a lot of us, especially as we become professionals, we go a little bit further. Sometimes we, we kind of forget that we have to maybe keep investing in our audience and our own circle to be able to keep them interested and, and keep them appraised of what is going on with our, you know, with our performances and things like that. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you guys. You guys have been a spectacular group to interview with. Thank you for all of your answers. You've been really, really wonderful. Um, I wish you the best of luck in the competition. I wish the best of you luck in your futures. And I really can't wait to hopefully when all of this ends, come meet you in person. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll all, we'll see you soon.
And today I get to have a conversation with the Broken Quartet, which is made up of Kaylin Brown on violin, Sophie Chan also on violin, and Casey Shea on viola. Obviously, as our viewing audience can see, you are a trio, but your name is the Broken Quartet. You have to tell me how you came up with this brilliant name. So we were originally, Casey and I were part of a quartet before, and then um, we had this thing where like, it's kind of a joke, but like we would say that we're broken during rehearsal and whenever anything went wrong. So it just kind of turned into like a broken trio, but then we were like, but we were a quartet. So <laughs> it's now a broken quartet. And then we have Kaylin, so it's less broken, but you know, <laughs> that's the origin. <laughs> Can you tell me what your process has been to approach rehearsing socially distanced and how diff maybe some of the challenges about making a video submission for this competition? Um, I recorded mine first because I have more of like the moving line from the start. So um, I recorded the first version, but there's like, when I, before we started making the video, I just thought of like, how are we gonna work on intonation? Because that's such a big part of chamber music and you can't even hear anyone around you. And like, especially this piece has a lot of tempo changes. It requires a lot of communication eye contact. I mean, every chamber piece does, but especially as like most of our rehearsals are focused on like, which part we're gonna make sure we look at each other and there's a lot of unison and just things like that, so. I think the biggest difficulty is trying to match phrasing and tempos without being next to the person that you're trying to match with. So I'm doing the editing for my group and the, pro uh, the main problem I've found thus far is one person can be maybe half a millisecond off, but it's in unison. So you can tell in the audio recording that something's not lining up and that's been a big challenge because that's what makes chamber music great is being able to play next to someone and be perfectly in unison with them. But being connected through video is making that process incredibly hard. We started this piece since, I believe, was it November or something like that? Like we started way back in fall on this particular movement. So we've had so many chances to work with each other. We know everyone's part from working with coaches and just we've, um, look through the scores with each other so many times like we know our parts really well so that's made it a lot easier in the tempo changes and things like that um, we've also been able to perform this piece a couple of times oh, together wow. yeah um live so that's why i feel like for us it'd be a little bit different setting tempo changes and things just because we've played together so many times and it's this piece specifically how are ways that you think that you would approach getting other students or other people your age to come and listen to you play? I think social media in this aspect has been incredibly beneficial because through social media you can promote a lot of concerts and whatnot but especially with social distancing creating like like us creating these virtual quartets and trios and then showcasing them on social media is a great way to draw people's attention to classical music and it's not just us like obviously the ASO is doing many of these like at-home concerts and as Sophie mentioned before Yo-Yo Ma and I feel like because now everyone is at home and no one can go out to watch concerts and everyone's usually browsing social media of some sort having right. the ability to share the music through this virtual platform is really helpful for getting people into classical music. I'm a big believer that the atmosphere is a huge part of live performances because there's so many things you can just watch online now. You could watch, you could stream the Berlin Phil, but it's just not the same as being there because it's like there's just something that you're missing by being disconnected or this barrier, like the, the distance barrier. Like you can watch them, but you can arguably see them better from like a screen. They'll like zoom in on people and things like that. Right, but right. The atmosphere is so different and it's just something that you feel and you can't visibly, it's not tangible. It's just something you feel by seeing it live. 
Well, it's been wonderful talking to you guys today. Thank you for coordinating at the last minute to be able to do this. Best of luck in the competition. Best of luck uh, in making your recording. I'm really looking forward to it. And I really hope I get the chance to meet all of you in person when all this is over. you. Uh, can any of you give me an insight on how you've been able to rehearse and prepare for this? Okay, so we've each been practicing our parts individually and to put together the video I started first since I'm the harpist and so the harp is basically like the foundation and so after I recorded my part I send it off to Ben so he could add his flute part over it and then we're sending it to Claire next. What we did originally was we had Madeline send some videos of her going through the part with just the just her by herself. Okay. And then Claire and I gave feedback and we tried to play along with it. Okay. And we told her like, oh, I think you know, maybe we should have some more time here or maybe we need to go faster here or we like what you're doing here. So that way we could understand like how we were going to go about playing our part when it was our turn to record. What challenges were particularly hard to overcome? What has been the most difficult part of this? I would definitely say putting together the video because since everyone doesn't start together, it's been a real challenge cutting the video down exactly so that we, we um, that Ben comes in exactly after I finish like my first one in the beginning. And also, um, I haven't used much um, software such as, so we're actually using iMovie to edit our video, and I right. haven't done much um, technical stuff with iMovie besides basic videos that I use for school and stuff. So yeah. I really had to learn how to um, do the editing process, mainly from watching YouTube videos, and so that's been a real challenge, especially layering the videos together. May I ask you, how are ways that you might get other students or other people your age to come and listen to you play, perhaps the WC in, in particular, or just um, gender music in general? I really like how ASO has like theme nights where it's like Star Wars themed or Harry Potter. So I feel like if we did something where the music revolves around a, a kind of theme, um, or if you just even throw in some pop songs in between the classical, I feel like that would really <laughs> make people want to listen. Yeah, just because like this day and age, like, oh, it's today, I felt like social media would be like one of the ways that would be a way to like get news out of like performances, like really fast. And also if you like included like, oh, clips of rehearsals or like fun things, like other than like play music, then you can like, people will be able to like, be able to see our personalities and then like, oh, maybe like want to see us perform too, to see like. Like all reality TV, right? Uh, the Food Network. You can't smell or taste the food, right? But you watch it, you watch these competitions because of the personalities behind them. Well, anyway, I just want to thank you guys. You guys have been a really great group to talk to, a lot of fun to talk to. I can't wait to see your performance. I wish you all the luck in the world making it. It is a huge mountain to climb, especially if you are thinking insanely to do more than one movement. I, I know this piece pretty well, and I can imagine if you can, if you can figure out the recitative opening of the first movement, the rest of it will be easy mode. Um, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you guys for joining me today, and best of luck in the competition. First of all, 
How did you come up with the name Ignis Quintet and what is its significance? So basically the Ignis means uh, fire in Latin. I just found out on Google translation. Okay. So the reason we came up with this, uh, when we had a very first rehearsal in a Atlanta Symphony Hall, there was a fire alarm went off and we all thought like, like, yeah, there was a fire in the symphony hall and we were like joking around like, yo, the symphony hall burned down like that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's, it was really random and somehow we had to like name up our group names. And I thought like, I just searched fire in Latin because I thought, I personally thought Latin is a quite cool language. So I translated fire into Latin and it was Ignis and I, oh wait, that's a cool name. So I suggested this name to our, in our group chat. And somehow everyone agreed with this. Just like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we uh, kind of assembled through the ASYO chamber players. We all signed up. We didn't really know each other that well before um, before we signed up to play uh, as a quintet. But we all, they put us all together and now we're a quintet and it's pretty cool. You know, it was actually, it was actually pretty easy. I've, in past quartets I've had, you know, it's not always as easy. Everybody doesn't always like each other, but this one, everybody's super easygoing. Like everybody shares their opinions in ways that are respectful, but also, you know, everybody, everybody gets to be heard and we're all pretty, I think we're all pretty laid back, so. Now you have to create this digital art piece uh, based on the Mendelssohn Quintet, which uh, I'm sure has been incredibly challenging because you are our biggest ensemble. You have to combine more tracks uh, than anyone else. Can you guys describe what that process has been like for you? Uh, who started it? Who is the primary recording, et cetera, et cetera. Anybody want to take it, take a shot at it? We kind of all agreed that Mila would be like the first one to record because she's like, she has a melody, like good deal of time. She's the one who sort of cues us in even during normal rehearsals. Okay. So we had Mila record first and she was like going off a metronome and stuff. Oh, um, you guys set a metronome a timing for you guys all to play with. Yes, with the exception of the end where I think, and I think she was trying to like do a little bit of like, like rubato sort of in between uh, at points, but for the, yeah, like the metronome was sort of line. Um, and then from there, it was just kind of like, we all just sort of had a go at it, I guess, based on like when our availability was like, we, like as soon as like try and record. Yeah, and right now I'm, I'm in Korea and like, because of their circumstances, like apartments, you can't play, you can't play later than 8 p.m. And no before than 10 a.m. So I had to, yeah, I had to let, I had to record, like find recording between those times and I, I have to do something else. So I, I think I only got about two hours to record, practice and record. I personally think that we practiced a lot because okay. at least, because we at least practiced two hours and um, usually, you know, as I remember the first rehearsal, we practiced straight three hours, I guess, yeah. Ooh. Actually, one of the, my favorite things about this group in particular is that like, it really is such a collaboration. Like, I feel like every run through we have, everybody has one thing that they noticed about the run through that they want to fix. And so it kind of feels like, okay, well, maybe I'll say the first thing and then maybe Cal will say, oh yeah, in this spot. And like, it literally, it's like so collaborative. Like everybody, I feel like everybody always kind of puts their two cents in about, okay, what we should fix and yeah I don't know I guess that's one of the things I really like about this group is that everybody's kind of always thinking how can we make this better and how can I communicate that to the group. I've really enjoyed this conversation with you guys you guys are awesome I cannot wait to hear your recording because it is the one quintet that we have knowing that you have to stack those five layers on top of each other with one of my favorite pieces of all time uh, I wish you the best of luck and uh, you know stay safe stay healthy it's been a pleasure. So I wanted to ask you guys, how did you guys come together? What made you decide to do the competition this year? 
I've known Grace for about four years. We used to play in the trio together when we were younger. And uh, Evan, um, he, his mom is my teacher at school, actually. So, um, and we were actually roommates at Bowdoin this past summer. So we were like... May I ask what inspired you to enter the competition this year? Well, we did it last year and we really enjoyed it. And I mean, performance opportunities are kind of rare as a trio. We don't have a lot of them and it's a really great one. And so we... We liked it a lot last year, so I mean, there's no reason not to do it again. But we were expecting to do it live, so, yeah. All right. Well, that leads me to my next question, then. Um, when you were able to actually get together live and rehearse, can you give me a little window into your process? Anybody run the rehearsal? Uh, what do you tend to do? Well, um, most of our rehearsals are usually us telling each other how bad we are. We criticize each other um, a lot, but it's constructive criticism. Well, that's that's really wonderful. Like, you know, I think that's the part that a lot of people, uh, classical, even classical music audiences, don't see. The fact that you have these relationships and you have these friendships outside of the music. Yes, yes, you're performing this high-minded stuff, but you know, the human interest story of your relationships to each other, your history to each other, is actually even more interesting sometimes. It gives context to how your musicianship is executed. How have you been able to rehearse and record uh, while socially distancing? Or we're we've been talking about phrasing and certain measures where we want to take time or certain measures where we want to do certain things. And we've been zooming to remind each other to do these things, I guess, because I guess it's hard. A lot of times, like, we haven't gone past Grace yet, but Grace will record and we'll say, oh, there's something that we want to tweak and we get really annoying about it, but we end up having the, we haven't gone faster yet. So it's been the process, but. Uh, what are the parts that are the hardest to coordinate with each other? Well, um, to this day, we've still had a lot of trouble at the beginning, like Grace said, but um, really? just like the entrance, the, I don't know. It's a lot of it's me, but like, I like to have my own creative liberty sometimes. And that's <laughs> kind of what I yeah. How did you go about solving the challenge of putting together a video performance while being distanced? You referred to this a little bit before, the fact that you would call each other to adjust the primaries uh, recording. Are there other challenges that you have found in your own musicianship to be able to play it this way? It's been really hard because you have to, I feel like you have to really get your own part really down. And it's in a way that you usually like, at least from me speaking, like, I don't get to that level. I feel like now that I realize, like, now that I'm actually realizing that it's just going to be me playing and I'm going to be having to fit this into this, I realize, like, wait, that note's out of tune. Wait, this note's not, I'm not really counting well here. Wait, this is not, this is not in time. And it's kind of crazy. And I feel like it's going to really going to help us in the long run. Um, I have to confess, usually when we rehearse, when we, when we could be together, I would always hide behind them. Oh. But now that I've actually had to listen to myself play, um, nothing's harder than playing like a soloist, especially in such a busy piece. So yeah, that's been one of the challenges. And in the era of digital performances, what are, well, how would you approach engaging an audience online? Well, social media has been real popular these couple of days. And especially like Instagram, I feel like people have been really able to advertise classical music as whole. Well. And videos, like practice accounts, have been a really popular thing. And I feel like that could be a great way to, I guess, promote classical. Well, I was going to add to what Toby said. I've seen a lot of people, like, like famous musicians and stuff, go on. They have their Instagram videos, and some of them do, like, cool stuff with it. Like, they'll go outside into, like, some crazy setting. Like, and then, I mean, I saw your, your Deadpool video. That was really hilarious. So, like, things like that with, like, costumes and just like kind of mixing it up well you guys it has been great talking to you guys today you guys are an awesome ensemble i can't wait to see uh what you do with this great piece i wish you the best of luck um and you know continue having fun with this project all right <laughs>
the, one of the first things I want to ask is, first of all, um, were you a group uh, before, the, before this competition? Have you played together before? Uh, yeah, yeah we, we formed this, uh, we formed actually last summer. Uh, we've known each other for a couple of years now because we've been in the same uh, youth orchestra. Okay. The Atlanta Symphony Youth Orchestra. And um, so we are kind of in the front areas, I guess, of the orchestra. So uh, I kind of like reached out to Lexine and then we, we agreed that Yuji would be the best choice as our violinist. It was, it was a matter of location too, because all three of us live pretty close together. Can I ask you, who would like to explain where you guys got the name Tangent from? So if I have to be honest, we, uh, we thought up the name because we go on tangents during rehearsal. <laughs> okay. um, but we did make up an actual meaning for the name so that it's not just um, something that we can say that happens during rehearsal. Okay. Um, so we said that for tangent, we came up with because uh, tangent is like a point where a line intersects another, like a circle or shape. Right. And we thought that all of our different ideas came to a single point when we made chamber music together and rehearsed together. So in the music making process, uh, it's a pretty definitive word for how we operate as a group. All right, let me ask actually a question. Um, now, of course, that uh, the virus has hit, you can't see each other now. Um, how has that rehearsal process had to change? Have the roles changed because of that? I mean, I would say this process is difficult for everyone, but um, some of the challenges for me uh, were to, to get like a really clean shot that had, um, that you were able to match up with the first person that to record for a whole entire video, um, right. for a whole run through. And I think that was the hardest part for me because uh, we didn't want to keep it too metronomic. So we right. actually didn't use a metronome. And that uh, I did found that that was a lot more challenging because there's certain places where uh, you weren't exactly able to follow the other person's thoughts about how to phrase something or how to slow down or speed up in certain areas. So that was the hardest part for me. Um, we had actually worked, we had done a previous competition before this, uh, working Wait, on this piece quite a lot. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we were basically, we haven't changed much. So we were just going off of what we practiced before the competition and trying to recreate it from memory. Now, as the primary, what are some of the difficulties you had in getting that track down? Had you recorded this piece before like this? Yeah, we were able to use that as a good reference point for this. Um, but I would say recording alone was quite difficult because there are parts where the violin has melody and we're usually, we're usually uh, UG would take time or interpret it a certain way and I would just have rest there. So I did find it hard trying to estimate like when he would finish his phrase. Um, I would definitely say uh, I'd prefer performing for a live audience than recording just because I, I believe that you are actually your worst enemy. So when it comes to recording, even the most minute detail that the audience might not even realize, um, you're gonna notice and you're gonna wanna do it all over again. And right. just, that process is just so painful. Um, I think there's different challenges to each, but um, definitely like um, the amount of criticism you put on yourself is a lot greater in front of the camera than, the, than an audience. Um, I think it's helped me like, be more aware of other people's um, parts that are going on in the music and being able to like expect and try to like visualize in a sense the, the other parts while I'm playing by myself. So it taught me that I should be more aware of what's going on around me. Even, even, even more than before. You know, yeah, even more than before. Experience. All right. You guys have been a great group. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Thanks for coordinating your schedule to be here. I can't wait to hear your performance and best of luck, okay? Thank, Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll see you guys.
And now for the moment these talented high school students have been waiting for. The winners of the 2020 Franklin Pond Chamber Music Competition High School Division. In second place, our runner-up is the Sycamore Trio. Congratulations. Now for our grand prize winner, the Tangent Trio. Magnificent job. Let's enjoy the Tangent Trio's full performance with Yuji Yamada on violin, John Cho on viola, and Lexine Fang on cello.
Well, it's time to bring this celebration to a close. Congratulations to all the incredible competitors, their families, and their teachers. We will never forget what you've accomplished for the world of music in this historic time. Thank you to the faculty and supporters of Franklin Pond for your tireless efforts throughout the year, and to our incredible judges for their generosity and expertise. May all of you out there stay safe and healthy until we can all meet together again in friendship and artistry. I'm Alpen Hong. Thank you for watching, and good night.